Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Sports. I am Ralph LaBella. And I'm Ron Sen. There's nothing like the joy, the thrill of athletic competition, and especially a tight game like California, where one girls high school team smacked the other team to the tune of 161 to two, leading to a two game suspension for the coach for unsportsmanlike play. What do you think, Ralph? It was only 161 to two? Was it 101 to two at halftime? I think it was 101 to one at so halftime. So we let up, we let up at halftime. That's right, he? he took off the press, he said, look, you know, I didn't know they were that bad. Really, I didn't know they were that bad. Yeah, you, you gotta get to a point there where number one, I know coaches, the rule is you play hard the first half, no matter what the score is. I mean, not, not 101 to two. I mean, once you're ahead, I mean, once you're ahead by a pretty good score, you know you're gonna win. Then you tell the girls you want five passes or maybe 10 passes before you shoot the ball. Or take five, towards the end of the game when you're up by that many points in the second half, maybe not even shoot the ball. Pass the ball around. If you're playing a clock, give the ball up or whatever. But my, my thing would be, oh, oh, I want five passes, no fast breaks. They were probably, they had to be stealing the ball and going sure. for layups. I mean, you end it, but Ron, I see that now. I mean, I see that now. I've gone up against coaches this year that are upset if they don't beat you by at least 20 or 30. They'd want to beat you by 40 just so they could, you could show it. And they get upset when they only beat you by 12, 15. I mean, we're playing some of the top teams, and I can see it in the coaches. When they're telling the girl, we played one game early in the year against one of the top three teams in the state, and they were up, I think, 16 points at the end of the game. And they had the ball, they got a rebound, and the coach is going eight, seven, six, five, so the girl with no much time left so she could shoot the ball. And I know what I do, I don't even say a word to the, to the kids because it's basically up to us to play better. Well, I remember watching an AAU game a long time ago and the girls team was ahead by 15 and seconds were ticking down. A girl dove, took out another girl's knee, took out her ACL with two seconds to go in a blowout. You know, so I tell kids, be safe, be smart, don't get hurt at the end of a game that's not competitive. And, uh, you know, the number one thing is I want the officials to keep the players safe, but sometimes the players, it's not, it wasn't an official problem, it was the player kind of over-enthusiastic. You know, but I, you know, I see it, you see it nowadays, not like this, but you do see it, you know, when, again, teams want to beat you by as many as they can, especially when you're playing against the A-League teams. I mean, they're very, very competitive, the players are, and they want, they want them to go, they'd rather beat you by 40 than beat you by 15. And well, you just gotta coach it like with my team. You coach them up, before you know it, they're playing against the best teams. Now they're starting to compete. They're starting to beat some of those teams, and before you know it, they're gonna be right up there with them if they keep it up. Well, you see a lot of strange things when you're dealing with people. Today in the paper, I read that Mayor Marty Walsh has, has a gag order for city employees not to criticize the, the possibility of the Olympics coming to Boston. Do we live in North Korea all of a sudden? Where's our, our foundations of the country are free speech, freedom of assembly, you know, the Bill of Rights, and you know, but you can't criticize a sporting event. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know me, if I think things are wrong, and especially with the girls, if people are taking advantage of, uh, you know, the girls that we're coaching, you know, and we know that the, we're using the high school gyms and the high school has first preference, but you know, we're losing out on some games and some practices because of different situations. And, you know, and I understand that, you know, the administration up there, you know, you have to satisfy them first, but also remember what I'm saying is remember that these are middle school girls and boys, you know, that have paid pretty good money to play in these programs and they've made a commitment and they've been, you know, and we've, been told what days we could play in practice and they're trying to work with us so sure. you know, I stay on top of it but you know the high school is pretty good you know I get aggravated sometimes but because I'm thinking about the girls and I don't and they're at an important time now in their development and I basically don't want anybody messing with them right everybody's situation is different um, you know in, with my group we really need more practice we have we have a lot of games which it's tough for us. We just have a lot of players who don't have very much experience and they probably don't get as much out of games as they would out of practice. Not, not complaining, just stating a fact. Um, out of the postseason playoffs, one 
sidelight story, which is interesting, is will Peyton Manning be back next year? Now, obviously, he has to pass a physical. I'm sure he would like to not end his career on such a big negative as this season was. They'll have a new coach in Denver, Gary Kubiak, who's obviously in a situation where I'm sure he wants Manning back. On the other hand, he can't really come out and look like he's trying to push Manning on anything as a new, new coach. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, something happened there, Ron. Other than Manning, you know, getting tired towards the end of the year, losing a little on, on his throws, I think they were down on Fox for some reason, you know, and I, th I think they're going to be happier now. They have Kubiak, right? right. I think they're going to be happy with Kubiak. Manning's going to get $20 million. He's not going to give up $20 million. He'll be back. And look, they had the second best record on a really tie with the Patriots, but the Patriots beat them, <clears throat> you know, in the, in the AFC. So, I mean, they have a very good team. I think if you get the edge back, if the players stay committed, I know a lot of them are free agents now. How many of them are they going to lose? But Manning will be back, and they'll be good again. Well, in the NFL, they have something called the Rooney Rule, where coaching vacancies have to include uh, uh, interviews with minority candidates. And it's pretty hard to see that happening. It surely looks like there's a lot of recycling action going on. John Fox going to the uh, Bears, which, which that might be a pretty good hire by them. I think he's a decent coach. The problem with the Bears is they don't have a quarterback. Cutler's kind of not, a, not viewed as a big leader. Right. And McDaniels is staying with the Pats, right? Looks that way. Yeah, I, I, I heard he doesn't want to go. He wants to stay with the Pats. I mean, why wouldn't you want to stay with well, the Pats? The biggest mystery is Doug Marone leaving the Bills. He's going to get paid $4 million from the Bills not to coach next year. And now he's an assistant head coach and, I think, offensive line coach for Jacksonville. That's a mystery. Yeah, and you got Ryan up there at Buffalo now. That's going to be Never. interesting. I'll tell you, though, he's going to a team with a great defense, but he doesn't have a quarterback. If you don't have a quarterback, forget about it. You know, you're not going to win. Well, it'll be really interesting to see there's going to be some jockeying for position to try to get quarterback. The Eagles have said they want to move up. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be able to to get uh, Marcus Mariota. Yeah, I love Mariota. I mean, if they get him, they're going to be in great shape. And he's just got everything. He can, he's quick. He's got a good arm. He's a real good leader. And, uh, you know, every team will want him. And then, you know, we don't know about Jameis Winston, what, what the situation is there. He'll get picked. He'll go in the first yeah. round. Yeah, he'll he's go tall. High. He's got a good arm. He's a leader. You know, I mean, he, he comes up with big plays all the time. I mean, they had a bad break against Oregon. I mean, they had four, five turnovers in a row just about in the second half. That would have been a very good game. Well, what's hard for me to understand is how Ohio State can win the national championship with the third-string quarterback, guys playing only his third game in college. He's terrific. Well, look at Flutie with BC. Sometimes you're a third, fourth, or fifth-string quarterback, and you have the talent. You haven't been given an opportunity yet. He's going to stay with them, which is surprising. Well, we haven't talked a lot about... Um, What's going to happen? We, there is a football segment we're going to talk about what's going to happen with uh, the, the Patriots and Seattle. Let's talk a little bit about the game against uh, Indianapolis. What were your thoughts? Well, I was wor I'm always worried as a big fan. You want them to sure. go to the Super Bowl. So you want them to go to the Super Bowl so bad, but they still have to win that game. And you look at Andrew Lucky, but you look at the success the Pats had. And a lot of people I talked to were really cocky. They were right. They said they're going to kill him. There's nothing to worry about. So I said, there's always something to worry about. It's football. I mean, what if we turn the ball over? What if we have problems? And we, I said, we should do it. The one thing I was confident about, though, is because of the Baltimore game, I said, they're going to play great. The defense is going to come up big time. That's one thing I said. I said, because the defense is not happy about the way they played against Baltimore, especially the way that offensive line of Baltimore dominated them. So I was confident they were going to, the defense was going to come back and play solid. But you're still worried, you know, you're still worried. Well, what I like to do is go to the opposing newspapers after the game and look what their sports writers said about the game. And it was really very interesting. The first thing is they, they blamed Chuck Pagano and the coaching staff said they made no adjustments. They came right. in with the same game plan as before, didn't work, they never changed anything. How would you expect it to work? Couldn't stop the run really couldn't move the ball on offense. Second thing, they blamed the receivers. They said, T.Y. Hilton's overrated, Reggie Wayne is old, uh, Moncrief is a, is a kid, 
you know, you, you can't hope to be successful with out a better supporting cast for Andrew Luck. Now, now I was waiting for, well, how about Andrew Luck? He threw a couple interceptions, really didn't show a lot. Had reasonable time, a fair amount of the time. I thought the offensive line wasn't terrible. Most of the schemes the Patriots were playing, doing. This, yeah. You know, the schemes well, cause problems with him. You know, he's only he's in, his, he's in his third year. He hasn't seen many schemes like that. Just like when Peyton Manning was in Indianapolis, though, they can't bring themselves to write that he had a bad game or he's got to play better for them to be successful. Yeah. I mean, they cause big time problems. The thing that shocked me is the way Arrington played against Hilton. He yeah. played unbelievable. And then you have. Brown is still gets me nervous, the penalties. You know, and he can get beat deep. If he doesn't have help over the top, which they normally give him, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know if, I would, uh, if I'm comfortable with him being one-on-one -on -one with someone. He needs that help over the top. Because if he's physical and they beat him, you know, he's not as quick as some of these receivers. Well, they don't have great receivers uh, in Seattle. They've got well, that's Baldwin and Curse. So in a way, having Revis, I, got, I guess you'd put him on Baldwin. I would put him on Baldwin. And, you know what Chung's going to be, right? You know what Chung's going to be the whole game? Yeah, he's going to be the spy for he's gonna, Wilson. He's going to be in the box. Yeah. He's going to be in the box. He's going, to be the, the, he's going to be the eight guy in the box when Lynch gets the ball. They're going to go one-on-one -on -one with the receivers, and they'll, they'll still have, they'll still have um, McCourty back there to help out hmm. Browner at times. Revis will be all alone. Arrington will be all alone, basically. And you know Chung. Chung will come out to stop that run because you're not going to want to let Lynch dominate the game. Then you, you start... He starts dominating the game. Then this play action with Wilson, everything gets out of control. So that's my thinking. My thinking, Chung will be making a lot of tackles in that game. They want to control Lynch. And um, Wilson's not going to – if they learn anything in that game against Green Bay, Green Bay did an unbelievable job of containing Wilson. They, their rush was – they were smart with their rush. They were just coming up and they were controlling each lane. Well, Green Bay's problem is they were – dumb regarding situational oh, was, football. Oh, the coach, McCarthy, did a right. terrible Right, they had job. the play set up for the onside kick, and how they, do you muffed, kick a, they muffed that up. But how do you kick a field goal the first time you have the ball fourth in, in, a, in a foot? He kicks a field right. goal. And then late in the game, they make an interception, and the guy slides down instead of trying to return the ball. I mean, what, yeah. What's that about? So they pretty much got what they deserve. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Certain subjects in sports are just disagreeable. And we know there's plenty of cheating that goes on every day, both within and outside the sports world. We all know the Patriots footballs were underinflated. We don't know how that happened. Personally, I don't think it made any difference, but it's the topic of national conversation today. It was the lead on CNN. We don't have to worry about war, peace, taxes, genocide. We only have to worry about deflated footballs. What do you think? Really? <laughs> it is more important than war at this stage of the game. Imagine that. It, it's, it led nationally everywhere. It just led on C, uh, the CBS nightly news, I think. Uh, it's you know, crazy. They, it's the press. They want numbers. So they blow everything out of proportion. I mean, it's going on with the sensationalism. With Goodell is earlier new. <laughs> on with, with the Rice situation. I mean, I mean we heard it once. It's, who wants to hear it again? And they just kept going on and on and on for a month. You know, and I, I mean, they're getting the numbers. They're going to get the numbers here. The more people want to call and talk about it. Number one, the rest of the country hates the Patriots, so they're yeah. going to get into it. The, the fans in New England, they're going to get into it. They're going to support Belichick and Brady as the rest of the country's, on, you know, getting on them and really hitting them and hammering them because they dislike them and they they're jealous of the Patriots. It's that but, simple. You know, I th I'll tell you something now. And I just heard this on the way in. This is interesting. A current poll based on Belichick's press conference and Brady's, a current poll shows 48 states actually believe that Belichick and Brady are telling the truth. 83% of the people polled. Now, do, you know, do what you want with that data because, hey, you know, numbers lie, but... Well, who knows? I, I, you know something? Maybe it's just one of those things that the, the sensationalism of this thing is, it's really easy. I mean, find somebody that's wearing a Denver Broncos shirt, and they're going to say, yeah, the Patriots cheat. Find anybody, and, and any fan of another team is going to call them the, you know, the Cheatriots or B Bella Cheat or whatever you want to call them. But, you know, I think the arrogance of Belichick 
You know, let's start with that. Well, he's a pompous ass. If he, it's that simple. If he could have came out today and actually not acted like himself, I would have been impressed. But, you know, it's that uh, uh, we're waiting for the investigation. Uh, you know, we're gonna, I'm waiting to be investigated. I'm waiting to be investigated. I mean, I wanted to punch him in the face. You know, I think he's the greatest coach I've ever seen. And I wanted to just hit him and say, you know, Bill, it wouldn't hurt to just say, you know what? I have no knowledge of any of this. I'd like to tell you differently, but I do not know what happened. We don't do that. And, you know, furthermore, I would have said not for anything, but the team did better in the second half with the alleged real ball. So what's the difference? You know, well, I, I think that it would be great to hear Belichick expound on when does equipment make a difference in football? You might say there's different kinds of cleats for different kinds of surfaces or I don't even know what because I don't know enough about the fine points, but he, I'm sure he'd have an opinion on what equipment might make a difference. Like you see some of these uh, shirts in college football, they've got a, no midriff, so you can't tackle the guy by the shirt because there isn't a shirt there. Well, that doesn't seem right to me. That's mm. not standard. Well, so you know something, you get an advantage. And I'll tell you, there's an old story about a college football game. I, I don't have the details, but I know this much. It, the whole field was ice and everybody was slipping. So the equipment manager ran out and bought uh, basketball shoes for everybody because the cleats were slipping on the ice, but the basketball shoes actually got more traction. And so they won. And it's, you know, in folklore, it's like, wow, that's brilliant. Was it fair? Because the away team couldn't run out and buy uh, <laughs> basketball shoes. So, you know, if they were bouncing the ball like a basketball now, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I don't want to come off as fanboy that's just saying, oh, this is ludicrous. You know, I, I wouldn't be for them cheating. I want them to win fair and square, but let's talk about a basketball, for instance, you know? Maybe if you're a passing team, you know, that really, you know, works the ball and you want that ball as hot as possible because you want more bounce. Whatever the reason. Volleyball, I don't know. You depend on that. Maybe whatever, for whatever reason. Football is the one sport, I think, that in that regard, Maybe a couple of PSI less. Maybe it doesn't make much of a difference. Well, the air conditioning went out for San Antonio, uh, Miami last year in Miami, and LeBron James really suffered under the pains of the heat down there. Now, did San Antonio intentionally break the air conditioning? I don't know. Did they turn it down? <laughs> did the Colts turn up the the heat indoors when they beat the Patriots? Did they turn up the sound? The to, Colts had the fake, they got caught with the fake noise. The CD was skipping. Right, everybody knows they did that, <laughs> but that's not cheating. Celtics years ago, the Celtics were against the Lakers. But what I'm hoping happened here is I'm hoping that they submitted the balls with 10.5 PCIs to the ref before the game. They submitted them at 10.5 and they were gonna Brady and was going to leave it up to the refs. If they caught him, they, they would have blown him up to 12.5, the minimum. And that's what I'm hoping happened. What I'm hoping didn't happen is that they submitted the balls, the refs okayed them, measured them, whatever they did, do, give them back to the ball boy, and then have them lower it back to 10.5. Because that definitely is cheating right there. But again, I'm hoping they submitted them under, the refs approved them, and then it went. So Brady and... The Patriots, they're not at fault there. They're submitting the balls to them. It's up to them to decide the, whether they're 12.5 to 13.5. Do you think the refs weigh and measure the pressure before every game where they just say, well, yeah, it feels like a pretty good ball to me? Well, well that's the pressure they put back on the, on the NFL. They put the pressure back on the NFL after the two interviews today. Well, it's true. Because yeah. both of them said they don't know what happened. Well, you know something? Does every person get audited with their taxes? I mean, come on, let's be serious. There are millions of people that cheat on their taxes every year. And, you know, the IRS, how many people do they audit? Don't audit me, by the way. I mm. don't cheat on my taxes. But, no, I think, really, it comes down to, you know, maybe this is one of those <coughs> common practices where this might be you find out that the refs didn't even bother. But I believe people are saying, how does Belichick know what's going on? I believe Belichick didn't know. I believe him from what he said today. I don't believe Brady. I think Brady didn't know the balls were well, going in under, well, under PSI about 10.5. But why, you know what, if he did know, though, and he likes it that well, way? Brady said that he submitted 24 balls before the game. So what, what's this 11 out of 12 thing? Where's the other 12? Well, the other 12 are put aside. They used 12 <clears> originally, <throat> and then if there's a problem with the, one of the 12, they throw them out. But did they not measure those? 
Well, yeah. the other 12, I guess, were, I don't know, because they, at halftime, the second half, they were normal. They were, they were 12.5 instead of 10.5. But people knocking Belichick, if you, had a, if you had a quarterback like Brady, smart, he's the guy that wants to be satisfied with the football. Belichick could care less. So he's yeah. going to leave it up to Brady to be comfortable with the football. He's not going to get involved in that. Well, here's the real problem. Whoever took care of this omitted to take care of that final football. And that's incompetence, and we can't stand for that. Well, you're right about that. 11 out of 12. I mean, why couldn't you do the 12th ball? <laughs> but I hope they get over this. I mean, you know, the press, they just keep on. I mean, they want the numbers. That's why they, they keep hopping on this. I mean, it should be over with now. Well, there's no yeah. such thing as bad publicity. And anybody who thinks that Robert Kraft, however upset he is, is losing a nickel over this, you well, know, I got a bridge I'd like to sell you. Yeah, he's made a few nickels over this, guaranteed. I just, I, it makes me wonder, though, going forward now, how do they recover from this? Because if they go out and beat Seattle, which I think they have a very good shot of beating Seattle, I think they match up well with them. And, uh, you know, okay, so they go on and win. And then what? Everybody, they want, you know, the asterisks. Let's, uh, you know, it's, it's an unfair. It's a, they cheated. Well, that's for the rest of the country. It's not here and the no, people that are really involved. No, of course not. But it's, it's the jealous you know, people, the ones that are jealous. But you know what? The, the thing that's, that saddens me as a longtime football fan is, you know something, it's, it, it's one of those things that if you go and read back on things, there were members of the Pittsburgh Steelers dynasty of the 70s that did steroids. You know, no one talks about it because it's folklore that they were the greatest team anybody's ever seen. So, you know, I'm not saying that they were cheaters or anything. It's for other people to decide, but nobody decides that. When it comes down to it, no one will ever give the Patriots the press time that the Steelers got, or the Niners got from the 80s with Montana. This is always going to be, oh, yeah, the Patriots. No, they don't, well, they don't sack and up. That was, you know, if you want a level playing field, those were not salary cap eras. Of course. So, so you could keep guys indefinitely. There wasn't free agency where everybody jumped from one team to another all the time. Well, the biggest joke is because of Spygate. That's the whole thing. And that was a joke. When did he use that information? He just kept them in some closet, the films of all... I'm giving signs because they, they were changing their signs anyway every other game. I mean, he just kept them in his claws and he had them there. Well, let's talk about the game. Obviously, the Patriots' number one priority is taking away what Seattle does best, which is Marshawn Lynch. We'll see if they can do that. And then the second part B of that is trying to contain Russell Wilson so he doesn't run around crazy. Well, and gonna be well they got a good game play. plan from, from Green Bay how to control Wilson. <clears throat> I mean, Wilson couldn't run against Green Bay. Green Bay did a great job. They weren't trying to sack him. They're going to keep him. They were him in pressuring the him, and they were keeping him in the pocket. He, he couldn't get outside. Yeah, you don't want him outside the tackles. And running the Patriots' this. secondary is strong enough to control the end. So I think the Patriots are in great shape to control that Seattle offense. And I think Seattle's offense can have big time difficulty. The key is turnovers. If, the, if Brady doesn't turn the ball over, you know, and that, that's going to be a key. If they can control the game, move the ball. I think they can run on them. Seattle's defensive line didn't look great to me. Well, the other issue is what's the status of Sherman and Thomas? He'll be fine. You know, people, well, people talk, you know, Sherman looked pretty hurt with that elbow hyperextension. I thought it was his shoulder. I can't believe it was his the, the way he was, ta it looked like he was taking the weight off his shoulder. And then he went out there on the field. I thought maybe he was playing possum because he'd do that. You and know? Thomas supposedly had a separated shoulder. That doesn't get better in two weeks. No, and that's so, okay I mean, I don't me. doubt that he'll play. He'll get all shot up and whatever, but it doesn't make you the same player. No, they gotta, the Patriots will still have to get creative. I mean, they have, a, they have a really good defense. And, you know, Pete Carroll doesn't get the respect that Belichick gets as a defensive coach. But oh, he's, he's a, very good. He is a damn good coach, and he's not going to – do something in the in you know he's not going to go out with a vanilla game plan like you know he knows Belichick is going to be you know they of, match up against Seattle than, better than any team that's played Seattle this well, year. Well, when they lost to Seattle in 2012, it was Tavon Wilson playing safety, watching people run by him like he'd never ever well you're right played DB. They're going to have to control Lynch. If they can control <coughs> Lynch pretty much, I think it's definitely going to be a Patriot victory. And I think Pat, the Pats offense is going to cause problems for Seattle. I really do. I mean, they don't have to go to Sherman's side. I mean, with the receivers they got in the way, Brady's smart. They'll come in the game. I think, I really believe early on they're going to cause big-time problems for Seattle. Well, the they're going to come right at them. Patriots haven't been great on grass over the years, so it'll be interesting there. But I don't know what – I didn't have a chance to look up how Seattle does on 
there's probably not that many grass fields anyway. Well, what's your prediction? Uh, I've always loved Seattle the whole year, you know, so I, I still like, well, the, to me, the deflate gate thing gives the Patriots a better chance because this is classic. It's us against everybody else. You know, see if, if we can tune out all the distractions. So if it weren't for the deflate gate, I would have picked Seattle. Now I'm going to pick the Patriots by four. What's the score, though? 25-21. That's interesting. I think it's going to be somewhere within a touchdown, somewhere in the 24-17 range. I mean, I like New England. I like them to win. I think they match up great. I think teams in the past for the Patriots, though, this bend-not-break defense drives me nuts. When you're watching them, the team goes downfield, and you're just like, oh, God, make a stop third and long, and they make a sideline pass for 31 yards for first down, and you're like, oh, get them off the field. And then something good happens, and you're like, I gotta go to the bathroom. The other thing is, if Cam <laughs> Chancellor tries to jump over the line on a field goal, he's gonna be sorry because somebody's gonna stand up and oh, yeah, Chancellor will get a broken up arm or something. I think it's gonna be the Pats 31 and Seattle 13. I, I really think they're gonna dominate Seattle. I, hope I think they're gonna move easy. the ball. <laughs> they haven't faced a team like the Patriots. I mean, Green Bay, they're not as good as the Patriots. They beat them at Green Bay that time, but the Pats right now are playing real good. I mean, two big games in a row against Baltimore and then playing great against Indianapolis, second half of the Baltimore game. I really look for them. I think they've really peaked back. We talked about that when they had the bye week, that the two, three previous weeks, I think they lost the edge a little after playing great yeah. football against great teams six weeks in a row. They get it back. I even think they're better. And I just think they're going to go out and dominate Seattle. I really do. I think, I think it's going to be like 31 to 13 in that area. We'll be right back. Welcome to Athletic Evolution uh, for an inside look at our football combine training. My name is Larry Thomas. I'm a strength and conditioning coach here at AE. Uh, behind you, you can see uh, a group of guys getting to work right now. We have 10 athletes this year working with us, all in preparation for their individual pro days at their schools where the scouts will come and take a look at them and put them through a number of drills to kind of test their athleticism and their ability and how they stack up against uh, you know, other guys at their, at their level getting ready for you know, the next step, which would be you know, the NFL. Um, we have a group of 10 guys, all ranging from schools from Boston College to UMass. Uh, we have a couple of local guys in Bentley University and Assumption College. Um, so it runs the full spectrum, different positions. We have a couple offensive linemen, some D-line, uh, wide receiver, defensive back. You know, so we're putting these guys through individual drills that are going to help them prepare skill-wise as well as athletically overall to test for their drills on the combine day. Thanks for stopping in for our football combine training here at Athletic Evolution. Again, my name is Larry Thomas. If you guys need any more details or information on what we're doing here with these guys and how to prepare yourself, feel free to contact us with all of our information provided to you. Thank you. Welcome back. Tonight for our sports conversation, we have the Prince of Puckdom, the voice of the Red Raiders, the Bob Wilson of Melrose Hockey, Bill Allen. Welcome, Bill. Welcome, Thanks, guys, for having me. Appreciate it. Good, uh, Talk a little bit about the team this year. Huh. Well, uh, we've got uh, covering a little bit of each. I, uh, we do, uh, we're active in the youth hockey, and so you know, from the youngsters on up, uh, working with Melrose Youth Hockey for my eighth year. So we coach peewees, so uh, the fun part when we work up with you guys at the uh, varsity level, chances are we've, uh, we know those families, we knew those players as they uh, kind of expanded their you know, skill sets and stuff. It's great watching them, uh, the hometown making good. Now, who do you, you coach peewees, you said, right? Yeah, we've no. been... Uh, working under uh, Frank Sorrenti's uh, program for a lot of years, and Pee Wee's 11 and 12 year olds. So what are they, like um, sixth graders? Yeah, in the second year kids are uh, middle school, which brings a hockey opportunity. So uh, we bring them from really conception. At that point, they need to know whiteboard, no positioning. And uh, so from the teaching perspective, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. We have to have them ready to start adapting to the school program. Now Hockey parents have a reputation for a certain level of intensity that isn't always matched in other sports. My own belief is that it has something to do with their son or daughter having a stick in their hand during the contest. But 
what's your impression? I think I think <coughs> it's, uh, some of it's uh, boy overblown when it does happen. For some reason, hockey takes it. And my experience is it's been uh, uh, pretty good because I'm, I'm at a secondary level with the youngsters. You know, when you're up at the select teams, it gets pretty competitive. Uh, you know, the parents banging on glass or fans in the stands. But uh, they've put rules in place that give the uh, the officials a little bit more power now. You know, somebody's uh, heckling them for, or a mom, dad, or even just somebody watching the game. The, uh, the officials have the right to remove them from the rink and uh, take that sort of thing out. Uh, respectfully, the officials are good. You know, one of the things they uh, put into place, uh, leagues like Valley, which is the premier youth league, uh, they have a, you know, right after the game the next morning, there's an email out there on your coach, you know, rate, you know, five questions, one to five. How was the pace? Did they keep the guy? You know, and it gives you a chance to interface with the officials. So that sort of thing, you don't see the coaches and the officials, especially with youngsters watching. It's, 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 it's not a good situation. Nobody wins anyway, you know, if there's a dispute. Uh, again, as the, as the level rises, so does the intensity to your point. And, uh, you know, with the, at the young, if we, we teach good sportsmanship and uh, let the coaches handle the discrepancies, it's better off. It keeps the kids and the, certainly the parents behind them kind of under control. How many months do you have them? Um, we really get going at end of August. I, I do like a little uh, meet and greet, kind of a mini training camp. We do an off ice. But that really, it's uh, Labor Day, and it ends like uh, first week of April. Uh, it's a long, it's a long haul. So how, it is. How often do you get on the ice? Um, an average week for us, uh, you know, Mondays, Wednesdays. Uh, at our team, the league has a third-party company come in and select skills on Friday nights. So we have, uh, we're teaching a concept, little scrimmage, three on threes. You know, we'll, we'll pick a, uh, you know, power play tonight uh, or point shots. And on the Friday nights, it's strictly skills. So maybe less pucks, more edges. Uh, they have stations, they'll blow a whistle every eight to ten minutes and the kids will change stations and you know, they jump, uh, you know, tires and they, uh, some of them have the parachute and, and things like that. So they make it interesting skill set development for hands and uh, a lot with the edges around now, the skating. We're basketball guys, so I, you know, I can relate to famous basketball coaches or role models. I don't really understand hockey enough to know, how, you know, somebody's system versus another guy's. Who are your formative mentors in hockey? Um, I mean, I, uh, I enjoyed what uh, Pat Burns brought here, uh, late Pat Burns, when he came in. Uh, at that time, the Bruins had probably the best of, uh, you know, the, the, the Ray Bork in his prime, and uh, certainly being a coach with a, uh, you know, hockey's got to have a little attitude, so he was able to escalate. Uh, you know, the players that had been there, then a the guy, if you remember, and probably dating myself here, like the Joe Thorntons and others that the kids watch today, as a rookie had the poise to know just uh, maybe like, uh, you know, the coaches uh, Julian's doing right now with, uh, with Basnack, the new uh, player, you know, just not exposing them or overexposing them to the, uh, the pace of the game. You know, so he taught him as he went, but uh, it was nice to see him get a Hall of Fame and uh, some recognition. You know, from a coaching perspective, we had him here you know, for three or four years with the Bruins. So, talk about the high school teams. The uh, uh, getting access, and uh, as you fellows know too, just uh, being able to go. Uh, very impressed with the girls. I mean, this is really their only their second year that uh, you, know, you take that young core of uh, really under freshmen. Now they're freshmen, but all of them played as eighth grade as last year. And uh, the poise. I think the ladies' record's running about 500 right now, somewhere 5'5", five, five, halfway through. But they're on pace. And uh, talking to the coach, uh, very impressed because they lost a lot of goals with, uh, you know, some of the seniors leaving last year. Gorman. Uh, Gorman yeah. was a big. So, uh, you know, I... I yeah. Well, they lost, too. We would have been a freshman this year. She was a strong skater last year. Yeah. So we just said it bodes well. Last year we said when, uh, when they had that... that uh, going on that the, uh, the, uh, the team coming up another year was going to uh, help stabilize. I think it's, I won't say overachieved, but it, I think it's ahead of its pace. You know what I'm a little concerned with, to be honest, I did most of the games last year, and they had the, those eight, five eight graders, and they were, had a real good day. Next to Gorman, they were the top five players mm -hmm. in the team. And I was really expecting in one year for them to really improve a ton and come back and be five of the top players in the league, maybe 
in the class of getting close to La Presti from Watertown in that area. Yes. And what I noticed this year is, I mean, the other teams, their forechecking is unbelievable. We can't get started half the time. I've done two games. I did, did the Masco Dick game, and I did a game last week, Lexington, and Lexington has half their team are eight graders. And they were all over the Melrose players with their forechecking and backchecking. We just couldn't get our offense going in either game. What have you seen? Um, maybe on the successful front, they, I think they've done good on the special team. You know what I mean? So their power right. play, it looks like that they're being a lot of poise. Uh, again, I'm giving credit to the young team and maybe staying from the positioning standpoint. Uh, the power play has been good at times. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, the speed and maybe uh, rising, taking that young core and asking them to go two levels up when yeah. uh, I think maybe... You don't uh, have a go on and... Well they, well, they could have, when you said last year, they made an impression and got a lot of ice. You know, the yeah. other coaches are, are savvy to that, too. And, uh, you know, bringing on a 2-1-2 two, two, or, you know, double four check on them is really bottling them up a little bit. But uh, in talking to Coach, she says, you know what, we're, uh, you know, we're on pace. We want to do better. But, um, yeah, I think with some more, uh, with more time, they'll turn the corner. They're a good core. But it's really taking off girls' hockey because these teams – I was, it was amazing to watch Lexington. They were so well coached for a young group, and the way they skated. I mean, it was almost like I'm looking at it, it's like the whole team, the five of them, like shifting with the puck. They uh, is break. That a, is, I, I don't know much about hockey, but no, do they but teach what, what that? You're acknowledging is a uh, formidable breakout. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're gonna, you, they have to come down low and work defense first and then uh, be able to turn the puck over. That's the, the beauty of the game uh, and being able to turn defense into an offensive breakout. So it sounded like, from what you're describing, they're, uh, you know, good systems. Yeah, really good, because they didn't give Merrill's anything. But you know what I'm concerned about, too? They have four real good defensive players. You know, Marissa Conley, P Conley Perry, and Gorman. Yes. But they very rarely attack. Am I, is, are they coached that way, not to attack? I mean, uh, and I, they're very good skaters. I think, I think the capability there, uh, Katie Perry, for example, right. I've seen her, you know, be able to lead. Uh, uh, Gorman, uh, maybe more like the Chara, maybe the more yeah. stay at home, uh, but with the, the skill set. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's different. They have, um, as you'll see, it, I don't think there's a set stage like what defensemen are expected to carry. Uh, you'll see that, I think, with maturity as they yeah, get to more of yeah. the varsity. So, uh, as you guys had come in and, and got a little bit more acclimated to what you saw, like the heavier weighted senior, and hey, look at the flow, and the young ones need to follow suit right. and, and strength too you get those young defensemen maybe quick but are they going to have the strength to get those pucks well, I remember we saw the, the woman net. team last year they had, one girl must have been six three uh, yeah and they had those sisters that could really fly yeah. and they uh <coughs> shoot the puck the skating i think the quality in general when you're talking about the uh, girls hockey it's uh it's not new to melrose anymore you know eight ten years ago it was uh just starting and there's great opportunity with uh it's just yeah. very, very, very good hockey now. Well, the yeah. boys have been playing very well. Tell us a little bit about what's new there. Boys, uh, boys, uh, seven three or eight three, eight and three, somewhere in that vicinity. So halfway through, and uh, you know, to Ralph's earlier point, um, you know, the first line's really strong. Uh, you know, uh, led by certainly uh, Corellis is uh, the defenseman. Uh, he had three points the other night against the uh, Lexington team. I think we got the back half of the doubleheader, and uh, Jack Hickey. Uh, uh, hat trick, so he's my, uh, you know, wrecking crew. I kind of give him the nickname because he's a uh, he's he's the essential power forward now. When you think of it, right? I know he's a football, yeah, uh, but strong upper body, uh, much improved skating that I can remember. You know, he's 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 got his quickness and he can finish. He oh, I love when he, tra when he trails Marissa or, or McLaughlin, and they give him that slide that puck back to him. The three of them work very well, like mm -hmm. triangling and stuff. Uh, McLaughlin's the playmaker, uh, you know, he's the hammer, and the warrior is uh, certainly Mercer. Like you say, he's just... Uh, he got two early goals against Winchester. Yeah, he gets them, uh, he gets, uh, he's the catalyst. And he doesn't take any crap either. Yep, no, I, I, <laughs> when, when you're mentioning just uh, he hobbles off a couple of times a game, and he, he comes out for more. Or oh, that so, Wakefield game, we did that. I, were you there at the Wakefield game? I don't know. The Wakefield no. game when he... I think they beat him 5-1 to one or 4-1. to one. He went into the penalty box three times, but he took a Wakefield player. Wakefield got really chippy as Merrill scored the first two goals, and it was borderline dirty with so many hits, right. and Mercer wasn't taking it. And he's looking at the ref when they're telling him he's going off too because, you know, he's really 
reciprocating for what they're doing, but he won't back down. But what I love about that first line is that all three of them are tough because they all played football yes. and they were three of their toughest players. But Merce is funny. He won't, he won't take anything. And then the other kids follow. Kids like McDonald, the young kids. Yep. And got a zero. Yes. He's playing terrific hockey, too. What, what do you think love, of him? What was I mean, the skill set? Uh, outstanding skill. Did you have him? No, the first, uh, first year I've had access to, uh, you know, that I've seen him on the team. And that's, that's going to bode well for, mm -hmm. I think he's a junior. I think he'll play, uh, when you talk about next year uh, moving up, he'll be uh, certainly a leader. But he's got the skill set. I think uh, coach uses him. Uh, I think the other game he had played center. You know, he's got his regular line, but special teams, he's out there. They tend to move uh, Mercer back on like a defensive yeah. position on, and uh, he covers the tops of the circle. And uh, you know, he's out there with some of the younger kids with uh, Champagne and. Uh, now the football yeah. team had a really long season, obviously, and it, so there wasn't a long transition between football and hockey. Do you think that might have affected the football players early as it took them time to get into hockey shape or whatever hockey legs are? I, I like to look at it as kind of an advantage. Because they're athletically, I mean, uh, the pedigree and, and or the oh, camaraderie, the word, just what they have going on. They, they were so close in a close unit of, of friends and uh, not letting each other down. So you knew the uh, compete level was going to be, uh, you know, perfect coming off the uh, football. But it does take a little time to get the legs in shape. It, it is a little bit different. It, you know, you're going uh, north to south and it's uh, not as many. Uh, I can't speak for the football like you guys can, but... Uh, Certainly, uh, the body contacts a little bit differently, um, and uh, I, I think here we are halfway through the, the record, surprisingly well. Especially, you know, the victory over Winchester and some of those teams there. Yeah, they dominated Winchester. Yeah. But you know, you look at the games, and both teams are flying up and down the ice. It's unreal. I mean, every you know every game I've watched, you don't know. You, well, you can't take it, go half speed because you'd be sitting on the bench. But they're flying up and down. They're hitting against the boards. And I'm, I'm sometimes, because we're doing it right on the ice, yep. and I'm watching Mercer come flying down, and I'm seeing a Winchester player come, and I'm saying, oh, God, he's going to get crushed. Takes the hit, bounces right back off. It's, I mean, uh, those kids are so tough. They're, they're, uh, they're 18, you know, some of them 17, 18-year-old, getting to the point where their bodies are at, uh, not their peak, but getting, getting close to that, that stage uh, physically, and uh, it's exciting. But no one else I'm seeing, Bill, is that the younger players are getting much better. Since the first time I saw them, you get you know, kids like McDonald, those younger yes. players. I mean, they were out there, and I think it's because of that first line in Corellis. Corellis just dominates games. I mean, I watch Corellis. As great as the first line is, where would they be without Corellis? Corellis yep. is unbelievable. He's out there 90% of the time, controls the puck, gets the offense going, plays great defense, and Phipps is in there where Cleese plays with him at times. Yes. And, you know, you can see that he really helps those guys out, although Cleese has really improved since the he's first He's got a lot, so. of, lot of size, so he's, yeah. he's, uh, he's got he's a little bit more. He's getting confidence. He's thickened up a little bit. Uh, good, uh, good playmaker. Uh, youngsters like Corielli and others that you're seeing out yeah, there as yeah. well. You know, that's the point you're making where the, uh, that leadership is uh, the others are they're passing the torch in a way. And, and Burton's uh, playing good. What year is Burton? I think he's a sophomore. I think, he's a sophomore? I think so. Oh, so they don't have him. Yeah, with with I mean, all the collisions you see yeah. in a fast-paced sport like hockey, how do you keep track of the occasional concussion or the concern over it anyway? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, for, for all the sports. And uh, for hockey, that's, uh, you know, at the pace you, you see them go. I mean, they have uh, uh, the officials. Uh, they have trainers on the benches of the varsity. You know, anything like that. They, uh, you know, no hitting from behind. Certainly, uh, they look for the numbers, and there's some stiff penalties involved there. Uh, you know, they're like, they're like the pros are just trying to keep that injury out of the game. We love the excitement, the fast pace of it. Nobody wants to see anybody get, uh, uh, you know, purposely on a hit from behind. Uh, falling to the ice at that pace, there's risk for everybody. I think uh, the players, if they're injured, they need to come off, the, you know, and uh, the officials won't let them, you know, I'm okay, coach. I mean, they'll, they'll make sure that they check them out. And uh, fortunately for... Uh, Middlesex is a good hockey league. Uh, I haven't seen. Uh, oh, it's unbelievable! You know, it's it's good hockey when we're talking about our our, our Melrose team and what we get to watch here with uh, Burlingtons and some of the other people. I mean, people that watch it on TV. You know, like I like to watch the games on TV too. But when you're there, I mean, especially when you're doing the games right on the ice, mm -hmm. I mean, I love that because I see, you see the speed. 
Although where, where you're positioning that uh, Kasabuski, the home, you got to make sure they don't shave you with the stick, right? <laughs> well, one a, time, one came <laughs> close. You get some pucks when they slap it around. You, you'd be wearing your helmet, Ralph, you know. But, uh, well, thank you for joining us tonight, It's a Bill. pleasure. Uh, thanks Great for talking to hockey, guys. And uh, thanks keep up the good work on the, uh, the broadcast. We'll see you again. Thank you. This is Chris Eck of the Boston Cannons, and you're watching Let's Talk Sports. Well, we have the second version of the Celtics, minus Rajon Rondo. To me, they're entertaining to watch. They're not very good, and they're on a killer West Coast swing. Tonight, they go to Portland, and I imagine they'll probably get creamed out there. But there's interesting basketball to be watched. I don't want to see Tayshaun Prince out there, though. I understand that they had to take on his salary, but they don't, that doesn't mean they have to play him. I'm pretty happy with the way Marcus Smart is coming along. He's, he's going to be a leader. He can shoot the basketball. He's unselfish, and he certainly plays really intense defense. They got a lot of needs, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm hoping the second half of the year they play smart, start smart, play him a lot, play Olenek a lot, get young in there. I don't know why they're not playing young that much. He should be playing a lot. We want, I want to watch those players play and develop, and I want to see them lose now. I mean, I was rooting yeah. for them to win up till about a week ago, but now you want to see them lose, maybe get the third or fourth pick. They're, they're fifth right now. Right. I mean, they're, they're not in a situation where they're going to have to work hard to avoid winning. They're, they're, they've got issues. Now, who would you say is the most underrated player on the Celtics, which is there's not a lot of overrated play. I don't think. Maybe Sollinger's a little overrated, but... Um, who's underrated in your mind? On the Celtics? Yeah. Well, the player I really like is Olenek, and I, I think he's underrated by the coaches and the broadcasters. They say he has talent, but he's not looking to score as much as he should be. But, I mean, what are you going to say, Zeller? Yeah, I like Zeller. I think Zeller is the kind of, he's not a building block like a, top three player, but I think he's a guy you can win with if you put people around him. But here's why I like Olenek. I like Olenek because he can do a lot of things, and I think the more he plays, the more confident he'll get and the more he'll develop. Number one, he's the best, next to Garnett, he's the best Celtic I've ever seen setting picks in popping. Sets a beautiful pick, takes up a lot of floor, and he pops off and never gets called for a moving pick like Garnett. Right? He's really good at that. He's a real good shooter. He's got a good follow in the lane. He's got to get a jump hook because he's got a big mm. body. But he can dribble the ball from the three-point line in, lay it in, and dunk it. The other day, he got the ball at the foul line, took one dribble and stuffed it with two-hand stuff. He got a pass. So I think he has a, he's got a lot of natural talent that he, all he needs is more confidence and more playing time. Don't fool around with that player. Yeah, That's I'm what not, I'm feeling. not crazy about his defense, but... I do agree that he's a talented offensive player. One of the things that most NBA teams have a few staple plays that they run. If you watch the game, high ball screens, you'll see a couple of guys in corners, another guy in a wing, and then you have a ball screen in the middle. The Celtics get nothing off that. They're just terrible at that. Another play they run is horns, where they have two big guys up near the elbows or higher, and the guards can go off of that one way or the other and set it on pick and roll. A third is, you have three guys on one side, and then you have a, a high guard and a, a forward cuts the other elbow, and they get the ball to, to him, so they go two-man game with what they call the pinch post. It's the weak side on uh, the triangle offense, too. They don't do that. And then the last thing is, they, they, as far as bringing shooters, they don't like to bring shooters. Ray Allen used to come off. You'd have two guys screening on one side, one on the other. They call that floppy, and he would go out to the wing or to the corner and very threes. They don't really have somebody that can come off in that way. They use yeah. Bradley off a weave to get Bradley into the lane for, yeah. for mid-range jumpers. They got to do a few other things too. I mean, number one, I think Bradley is overrated. I really do. I think he's overrated. When you talk about who's underrated, I think Bradley is overrated. I think Stevens is starting to see that. He's not a good passer. When he plays up tempo, up and up in your face defense, he basically always fouls you. So. He's one guy. I'd like to see Young playing with Smart more. That's what I'd like yeah. to see. Well, one really important principle is in basketball, don't foul jump shooters and never foul three-point shooters. And Bradley is always fouling three-point shots. You don't have to foul three-point shots. Contest the shot, get your hand up, challenge the shot, 
Don't foul him. Good Lord. Just so easy for NBA players to, to make three points. You know, good players in the NBA are, are up in the 35 to 40 percent on threes. So that's not the same as free throws. I mean, terrible. San Antonio's starting to play good again. They got Leonard back, so they're, they're strong. They're going to start winning most of their games. I mean, Golden State. How about Atlanta? That shows you, you know, you build your team <coughs> properly. Atlanta's been unbelievable. I mean, they, they, they have a shot to get make it to the finals this year. Yeah, Atlanta's really good. And, and Cleveland, obviously, is just playing 500 balls. They won four in a row. Yeah, so they're I playing think, better. Uh, I don't know if it was. How about James pushing his coach? Did you see that game? Well, he was trying to get it, keep him from getting tossed, I think. No, I don't, I don't. I think he pushed him to get out of the way with throwing the ball in. No. I mean, you know they had to talk about that. So, you know. I just don't see Cleveland as, as being there this year. I, you're right, the Hawks are really terrific. And um, I think, what are they, 34 and seven, something like that. They're really, yeah. really strong right now. Um, well, before we go, let's talk a little more about the Patriots in Seattle. Give me a, what do you think the number one issue is with the Pats in that game? Well, I think the number one issue is trying to sp um, avoid turnovers. And a lot depends on, I don't know what the health status of uh, Thomas and Sherman are going to be. I do not think you want to throw the ball down the field really aggressively. I think you want to avoid situations where you can turn the ball over. And I think they'll be able to run the ball. I don't think uh, Seattle's defensive line is overwhelming, especially if they, if they get something going passing-wise, that should open up some running game for, for Blount, who's really been pretty good. He's t tied for second after Marshawn Lynch at uh, yards after contact, I think it's 2.38 yards. He, he's a bowling ball, he really works hard. Yeah, and I think, again, the offensive line, Stork's back practicing, so right. if they have him back, I think the offensive line is gonna play huge. I'm really, really confident in the game. I think the Pats will be able to move the ball. Seattle, again, hasn't played a team like the Pats this year, and they haven't played a defense like the Pats have. I mean, the defense, I'm a little worried about the defensive line, but in the, against the Seattle team, they don't have to go in and they don't have to sack Wilson, just control him. Worst penalty ever this year, your favorite player oh. against Indianapolis. The guy's I, on the ground and, I was and Will Fork tries to give him an elbow in the head. And then he's I saying, mean, why'd you call the penalty? But let's get, quickly, how about the, the non-catch in the Dallas game, Dallas-Green Bay game? Well, I didn't think it was a catch. Now, what, what's the rule? The ball is you have to maintain possession all the way to the ground. Now, no, 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 unless, that's not it. Unless that's you've made it. a football move, which I don't think he did. I think he was just falling to the ground. But in the years past, I don't, if, if you took two steps. Two steps. Right. But, you know, but I in, think the way the, they, the way they call the rule is unless you hold it continuously and the ball, it, does, it can hit the ground, but it sort of popped up and then he recovered it. So but, I, I thought it was a non-catch. Right, in this case here, he catches the ball. Right. Takes three steps. After the ball hit his hands and he had control of the ball, takes three steps and then lunges for the end zone. Ball hits the ground. They call it in. It went up in the air, but they said the ground caused the ball the fumble. So in, in that case there, he had control of the ball. He took three steps and he made a football move. How's that not a completion? But you know what I get? You know what I'm starting to realize? The people in the higher ups, you know, you know, people in charge, all over. They're making terrible decisions and they lie left and right. I mean, they're telling you, I mean, I think they were covering up on that play. I think the whole league was covering up because I think they really know that it really was a reception, but they said, okay, we got to stick with this. So the head of the referee said, yeah, it wasn't a catch. And then you go to the higher ups and they're saying, no, it wasn't a catch. But the rule book, they read the rule book, one of the, um, Cullinan read the rule book and he says, how's that not a football move when he dove for the end zone after taking three steps? See, I, don't th I thought he took two, but anyway, you know, that's a tough call. And, and Bryant's as good as it gets as far as receivers in the NFL right now. Now, baseball season is going to be here before you know it. The Red Sox still don't have a number one starter. The, the price of a number one starter just went up a little bit. Max Scherzer, who he's good. He's kind of, maybe he's a one, number one, but $210 million for seven years, but that's a lot get, of money. Didn't he get a contract like Stanton? Like he gets so many, he doesn't get... Oh, it's, yeah, there's some deferred money, so it, he gets 
half the money in the seven years and then the rest is deferred. So it ends up being a little bit less in current dollars. And he gets a bone, a pretty good bonus that's deferred a little too. Right. So now the question is whether <coughs> Washington is taking on too much salary and whether they'll try to trade a guy like Strasburg. And that's when the Red Sox or and the Zimmerman. Yankees. Yeah, or, or Zimmerman. So the Red Sox or the Yankees might go, go for something there. I think the Yankees are content <laughs> with their starters. They're hoping that if they're healthy, they'll be okay. Although they lost McCarthy, who I really liked. And, right, he um, go to the Dodgers? Yeah, he went to the Dodgers, but their bullpen's going to be one of the best in baseball. They're probably seeing what Kansas City did last year with that bullpen, teams like them. And they're, again, they just signed two up. They just um, traded what's, for two what's other. What's the word on Tanaka? Is he healthy? Or? He's supposed to be healthy, and Pineda's supposed to be healthy. And you got to hope that um, they didn't sign Corotta. They lost Corotta, so I don't know where they're going to get the other starters. Right. Well, well they got Sabathia coming back. Right. And Nova. The other news today, big news in basketball, is uh, Kobe Bryant has a rotator cuff tear. He's shooting with his left hand. Uh, Did you hear that? No. So, you know, obviously uh, he's, he's come out recently and said he will not rest until the Lakers get Rondo. When did he say that? Oh, go figure. This how, week. How about Rondo the last two games? Did you see that? No. What did he do? Three assists and two assists. I mean, it's not, you know, what, know what's going to happen? I'm telling you right now. The Dallas fans were hysterical when they made the trade. And right now they're looking at him and saying, you got to be kidding me. Everybody's saying he's one of the best point guards in basketball. And they're starting to see what we see. Anybody who knows the game is starting to see it. He can't shoot. He needs the ball in his hands all the time to get the assists. Dallas isn't that type of team. They played at a half-court offense. And now you're starting to see it. He, one game he was 1 for 12. Another game he was 3 for 11. Well, the, the Red Sox are supposedly still in the hunt for Cole Hamels, although supposedly the Red Sox don't want to trade either Betts or Swihart. You can't have everybody. Uh, the, the, all this talk about uh, Christian Vasquez saved, the, you know, he th threw out 50% of runners last year. He had the second highest um, number of uh, strikes framed. Uh, he, he's just a terrific defensive catcher. Well, if you think Swihart's going to be, be better than that, so do you, do you want to move Vasquez? Trade then? one of them. Trade one of them. You don't, you right. don't want to get rid of Betts. Betts is going to be one of the best players in baseball in two years. Yeah, I think Betts will be good. You know, presumably Betts is going to be the leadoff hitter. The, the, there's still a lot of question what happens with uh, Craig. You know, this, I don't think they're going to get much for him, but I can know they can move him. What happens with Victorino, who's in the final year of his deal and can't stay healthy, and then you know, Daniel Nav is, you know, he's probably a number of four or five outfielder, so I don't, I don't well, see any big deal there. Their biggest problem is their pitching. I said it last show, their pitching. There's too many teams now in baseball that have good pitches that they're going to be going up against, and they're going to have problems because they don't have any real stopper. They yeah, they got these guys pitcher. like Porcello, Masterson, Miley. They're all but good, but they're not great. They got a type of team is they can win five in a row and they can lose five in a row, and that's what's going to happen during the season. They're going to go into big time slumps where they're going to lose games. The hitters aren't going to hit. They're going to get outpitched in most of the games. Well, they can't outpitch teams anymore. They're, they're still relying on Uihara, which that may or may not be reasonable at his age in the second half of the season. Beyond that, the bullpen's not really deep. It's still a work in progress. I think the team, I think the Yankees have a chance to, if they stay healthy, can win that East. You know, I don't think the Red Sox can win unless they get Hamill. Unless they make the, get rid of some, get rid of, trade Owens, trade Swihart, don't trade Betts, trade. Well, I know, the, the, the greatest players ever are the Red Sox minor leaguers who never right. mature. I've enjoyed seeing you tonight. I'm Ron Sen. And I'm Ralph LaBella, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Sports.